Okay, wow, so many beautiful faces here this morning. When I was a little girl, we had a stone wall around our barnyard, and I would stand on that wall, and I would take a branch, and I would direct the choir, and I would preach. You guys are a much better looking audience, <laughs> but a little bit more scary looking, <laughs> maybe. And I know all of you here today have a story. I would love to hear your stories. I love to hear the hearts of women and what you have done to make the best of life. Um, and you know, your story is important, whether it was a big one, lots and lots of suffering, or just a little bit. God is there for each one of you, and each one of your stories are important. My husband Elvin and I are married for 41 years, and we were blessed with six beautiful children, three boys and three girls. Those little boys grew up to be pastors, football coaches, foot basketball coaches. My girls' daughters have grown up to be my best friends, my encouragers. We have 20, Lord will, and now Lord willing, we will have 23 grandchildren in 2023. Um, we have 20 joy givers now with three more to make their appearance this year. So life is exciting. Through our marriage, we have faced difficult times, including my dad's death by suicide, financial loss, more deaths in the family, misunderstandings in our family and in our church. Did we get it right? No, we did not. Was there joy? Not always. But we attempted to be faithful and persevere. Today, all our children are faithfully following our Lord Jesus Christ, and we are enjoying being empty nesters, and we really are enjoying being empty nesters. And so, as you young moms, stay in touch with your husbands so that when the children all leave, you don't have to look across the table and say, who are you? What do we do now? Stay friends throughout your marriage. Just to let you know how human I am, we flew to Colorado for our, another, um, our daughter out there has adopted five children. We were flying out for the fifth adoption in January. And as I was getting off the plane, I was so excited about what was at hand. I get to see my daughters and two of the daughters were picking us up at the airport. And as I got up, my knees were hurting from being all squished up and, and I could hardly stand and I was trying to get myself all together. And, I knew when I had went to the restroom that I had pulled my pantyhose up and they had tore a hole in them. And yes, I still wear pantyhose. I know some of you guys don't even know what pantyhose are, but I wear a pantyhose. So I knew there was a big hole there. And as I got up, I felt my skirt kind of catch on the seat. And, but I gathered my belongings and I went off and I was thanking the flight attendants and I was thanking everybody. And I get off the airplane and I look down and my blouse is up, my skirt is down. I had a slip on. So that's to show you how human I am. But also, we don't all, you know, sometimes the happenings of the day just take over and give us, we had, I had joy. Um, it didn't really matter what I looked like in my mind at that time, but p pity the poor flight attendants and the, I think I even thanked the, the captain that day. Anyway, keeping joy in marriage and resources that I used were finding God's life for my will, written by Mike Donahue and Relentless Joy, a Bible study on the book of the Philippians written by Christine Patterson. We cannot keep something we do not have. True joy is found in knowing God, the author of joy. We need to connect with our Heavenly Father. Many times in trying to find happiness, it steals our joy. We find ourselves wanting that new Tupperware gadget, more princess house dishes, good health, pretty flowers, pretty dishes, Time for ourselves, and the list could go on. None of those things are wrong, but what happens when we can't afford that new stuff, when we don't have good health, and when our husbands aren't happy, and when our dishes break? Can we st and we don't even have time for a cup of coffee without somebody needing something. Can we still choose joy? James 1, verses 2 to 5, and I'm going to be reading these out of the ESV version. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. For if any of you ask wisdom, for any, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, it shall be given him. Can we really choose joy in hard times? Joy is an unconditional, positive, emotional state that God gives believers through the Holy Spirit. Joy is not the absence of trial. If we think that God promises us perfect lives and perfect marriages, we lie to ourselves. 
Perseverance is the ability to wait and endure patiently. Our faith is not in what we can't. Our faith is in what we can't see. Faith requires us to trust God. When trials come and test our faith, we have a choice to believe in God or to believe in our own plans. Trust is believing your future is wrapped in the love of God. Trust is what grows in our hearts when we give our doubts over to the love of God. God loves us so much, and he cares about each one of us. And those trials and sufferings and the hard times that we face come through that love that he has for us. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Each time we feel God is speaking to us and we willingly turn away, his voice grows a little fainter against the volume of our own well-composed plans. We need to hear God's voice. It's a voice that's always guiding and a voice that's always changing you. His will for your life is joy. His will for your life is rest. And his will for your life is forgiveness, gratitude, and purity of heart. In studying Philippians, Paul wrote these letters while he was in prison. Sometimes our life, marriages, can feel a little bit like a prison. Things happen that are just totally out of our control. And Paul tells us how to live so that we can rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 1, 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Many times we place unnecessary demands, pressures, and obligations on ourselves. This pressure does not come from God. We rob ourselves of joy when we think everything is up to us. Free yourself with that truth. Do your best and let God do the rest. Do your part, but don't forget, God is faithful to do his. Philippians 1 verse 21, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. When we stop living for ourselves and truly live for Christ, we find joy that cannot be taken away by people, situations, failure, weaknesses, or suffering. If people do not give us joy, then people cannot take that joy away from us. Joy is ours to choose. Philippians 2, 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So set aside from that verse we always hear, wives, submit, we just, it's our favorite verse, isn't it? Um, <laughs> let's focus on other, count others more significant than yourselves. Significant meaning important, worthy of attention, godly ambition, focusing on what God wants rather than what I want. A selfish, ambitious life will not lead to joy. Joy is really like the children's song, Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. So can we make our husband's needs and likes a priority in our home? You may say, but you don't know my husband. But never is it right to not do our part because our husbands are not doing their part. And also remember, Jesus comes first. So if your husband asks you to go against your God-given conscience, it's not okay. When we went out to eat with friends of ours, I asked the question, how do you keep joy in marriage? And the man's quick reply was, will all in attendance be mature adults? And so I said, why is the man's first response to think about physical intimacy? Ladies, that's the way they're wired. <laughs> Just like we plan our day, we need to plan for times of physical intimacy with our husbands. Let him know that you do care about his needs. And it's okay to flirt with your own husband. And to be a little silly in a godly way. Be creative. Men don't usually remember what you wear. But my husband does not forget the one day he came home, and he remembers 30 years ago what I was wearing that night. <laughs> because it was only a winter coat and his cowboy boots. <laughs> the children were at grandma's that night. <laughs> Physical intimacy is a beautiful thing. It's created by God, and don't let the world its view of physical intimacy and of sex spoil what you have with your husband. It's a beautiful treasure gift. 
that God created. Ladies, don't play the game. Is he going to remember my birthday, our anniversary? Man, I hope he got that hint. It is not prideful to talk about your upcoming anniversary or your birthday. We do not need to make demands or expect too much. Being a helpmeet is a helpful partner that is remembering that he may like to shop about as much as you like to change the oil in your own van. <laughs> the verse also, lie not one to another, really applies to marriage also. Be honest about what you like and or dislike. Also be willing to lay down those expectations if they don't happen. It's not a woman's call to lose her voice or be less than her husband. The Christian marriage is built on love, and love is anything but the desire to control. And that goes for the husband and for you, that love is anything but the desire to control. Women have been, I know we just, we want to be in charge. We want to take control of things, and we've got to give that up sometimes because um, that is not, it's not love. Remember when you were dating, you couldn't wait to see him. Do you make his homecoming at the end of the day pleasant? We love to be noticed and cared for and heard. Can you do the same for him? Live in understanding with your husband, treating him in the same way you want to be treated after being gone all day. Do you like to come home to a clean house? And I think one thing that was in our generation growing up, we were like, do everything you can to keep your husband happy. And I agree with that. But more than that, do to him what you want done to you. If you like coming home to a clean house, toys picked up after we be going all day, do the same for him. Um, live in understanding with him, treating him the same way. Do you like to talk about your day? Ask him about his, not in a nagging way, but we really do need to care about what happened in their day also. Men often have a really hard time talking about their feelings, or they might think you really don't care about what happened at work. Allow him to know that you really do care, and then take time to listen. And then we need to find ways of encouraging, and they need our compliments, and at times to brag about them. And in that, we need to find their love language. What really does say love to them? Is it a hot cooked meal? Is it telling him he looks very, very handsome? Maybe not as handsome as he did 20 years ago, but it's a whole new way of handsome. And to learn to, um, not in a bragging way, but to encourage and to, ver and to be there and, and to compliment him. Um, and sometimes in our heads we keep a list of if he would do this, if he would do that, if he would do this, if he would do that. How about you start keeping a list of all the good that he does do? Make that list. Write it down. Remember it. And on those days when... Ugh, he's getting on your nerves, read that list and, and make it a part of who you are and what you look at as your marriage. Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Contentment is learned. It is a state of satisfaction being happy right where you are. It's continuously realizing that our feelings don't have to be led by our circumstances. Contentment helps us to appreciate what we already have. Because of God and who he is, we can experience the joy that comes from being content. I do taxi driving for our Amish community. And one question I like to ask this winter to get a conversation started, because I love conversation, was what are your winter projects? So one day I was going to town with my husband, and I, just for the fun of him, I said, so what are your winter projects? His reply was, keeping my wife happy. <laughs> he graciously added, no, not really. <laughs> but I knew that there was truth in what he was saying at that point. Let's not add to their to-do list something that is not their responsibility. Husbands can do an awful lot to make us feel loved and appreciated and happy, but it's not their responsibility to help us find joy. That is our choice is to choose joy. Hebrews 12, 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
Jesus' focus was on his mission, not on his suffering. He endured the cross. What he endured on the cross could have taken his joy. The world has a way of blurring our vision when it comes to marriage. Sometimes things just look hopeless when our focus is off. We want things to be perfect, obedient children, husbands that meet our expectations, perfect vacations, beautiful homes, but that's not what our focus needs to be. Our focus should be on God. It's about God writing our story for his glory. So let's keep our focus on what is eternal. At the end of the day, what does really matter? It is heart issues. It's our focus on Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Giving is another way of keeping joy in marriage. God loves a cheerful giver. It's easy to keep things for ourselves, our time, money, talents, and stories, and our lives. But we are made for more. We are made to live beyond ourselves and impact those around us. And as we also receive joy, that brings us joy when we receive joy from others, from giving, and then that brings joy in our hearts. And it's also in that whole idea of keeping the right perspective on life. One thing when I would take my children to the doctor or any time I had to fill out a form, what is your occupation? You know, homemaker, boring. So I started writing down raising leaders for the next generation. To me, that was a positive way at looking at who my children were and the work that went into them. And God answered that prayer greatly in our lives. We don't have to seek happiness when we already have joy. And so we go to some joy killers in our marriage. Unresolved conflict. We are going to have conflict. Disagreements. But instead of growing resentment, can we remain positive and keep our perspective? We are on the same team. We both want our marriages to work. Can we remember to be kind? Conflicts need to be resolved before they turn to bitterness or prolonged anger. We need to refuse to allow their actions to control our reactions. We need to refuse to allow their actions to control our reactions. We need to admit how, to, how we feel and understand it's okay to be angry. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. We lose our joy at times because we're angry and we don't want to admit it. If we don't admit our anger and our hurts, we never process through it. And that's when it turns to bitterness, rage, and sin. We need open communication. First, this is first, ladies, we need to pour out our hearts to God and let God know how we feel. God already knows how you feel, but to admit it to him is very scary at times, but very, very valuable. We can tell God exactly how angry we feel, how hurt we are. We get hurt. Our feelings get hurt. We're sensitive. We're emotional people, and so we have those hurts. But we need to pour it out to God. Second, when the time is right, let your husband know how you feel. Not to prove him wrong, but with the intention of reconciliation. When you go to him saying, you did this, you did that, how about you go and say, Maybe I did something wrong. But with the idea of reconciliation, not, not necessarily to prove that you're right, but to be reconciled. And let's be quick to admit when we are wrong. And yet, don't play that victim mentality. Everything's my fault. I'm sorry I messed up again. Take ownership of when you messed up, but do not take ownership for their actions or reactions. If you have said something that has upset them, if they choose to become upset, that is their problem before a holy God. It is not your problem. You cannot just stuff everything in to keep them happy because that's not your job either. Your job is to seek joy and to seek God and his forgiveness. And then forgive. Forgiveness is the key that unlocks God's joy in your life. We have joy because Christ forgave us, and we are called to be imitators of God. We are called to forgive others, not as a pass to them, because God is the final judge, but, we are, but it is a way of finding healing and joy in our lives. Another marriage killer is comparison and envy. And Angie just spoke about en envy, and that was very, very valuable as we process life. Envy makes us feel less than adequate and not enough. If we want to experience true joy in our marriage, we must let go of comparing ourselves to others. 
How do we rid ourselves of unhealthy comparison and envy? First, what God has for you is for you. He only needs one of you. But if you don't do you, and if you're trying to do someone else, who's going to be you? So you be you because God created you with your gifts, talents, and abilities. He needs you. He doesn't need somebody else. Second, to rid ourselves of a comparison and envy is to set boundaries. We can do this by stopping looking at what everyone else is doing. We tempt ourselves to get upset about the highlights of someone else's life. We don't know the backstory. Don't be envious of someone, especially when you don't know what challenges they have faced. We are not all called to do the same thing. Neither is one person called to do everything. Everyone has been given different gifts and abilities, and we must seek God. Not, the other, not others for our gifts and purposes. Don't look for them to fulfill that you find what God has gifted you with. Another marriage killer is complaining. Philippians 2, 14 to 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that ye may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And talk about a twisted and crooked generation. We live in those times, ladies. When you complain, you look no different from the world. Complaining is easy. When God calls believer, but God calls believers to a higher standard when it comes to how we use our mouths. We should use our words to be thankful and to build up and not tear down. Complaining tears down because it focuses only on the negative, which prevents us from being thankful. You cannot complain and be grateful at the same time. We all desire to be blameless and without blemish. No one enjoys being around someone that complains. As a wife, we might have plenty to complain about, but does it really benefit at the end of the day? It only kills our joy. Anxiety is another joy killer. Paul makes it clear to the Philippians, do not be anxious. This is not a suggestion or just a good idea. Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7, do not be anxious for anything, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And in the peace that passes on, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Anxiety steals space in our hearts and minds where God's peace should be. Instead of being anxious, we should be prayerful. Instead of being worrying, we should be thankful. Can I truly trust my husband to make the best decisions for our marriage and our family? We gain nothing by being anxious, but we gain peace and joy by taking those requests to our God with thanksgiving, thanking God that he will work it out. Maybe not the way I think, but the way we can still have that peace and joy, even if it doesn't happen the way we think it should. And one thing that we went through a couple years ago, about seven years ago, we were living in a house that the owner decided to sell, and we knew we didn't want to buy the house. In the meantime, our daughter in Nebraska was having a baby, so we were going to go out there for the whole month to help with harvest and whatever have you. Well, while we were out there, the house went on market. So here we were. We needed to be out of that house. It sold much quicker than anybody imagined. So every time, so we were like, okay, we need a place to live. Um, so every time I was tempted to think and worry, I said, thank you, God, that you're going to provide a home for us. And he did. We found a house on the internet. We called the realtor and we came home. And on a Tuesday night, Friday morning, we signed the papers. Three late weeks later, we moved. And we love our little house. We love being there. So ladies, as we process all of this, let's be wow women, women of the word, going to God's word daily. God's word is powerful. Do you love the word of God? Do we take joy in the God of our salvation? And as you read, ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand who God really is. Not always asking for what I need or what do I do different, but asking God, who are you? Seeing God in the scriptures as a whole, that we can better understand the heart of God, to know his character, and then we can be be become better imitators of him. When we see God for who, it is, for who he is, that makes us want to follow him. When we see God as a holy, righteous, loving, kind, merciful father, 
We want to do what's right to follow him. But when we look at him as somebody that's harsh and mean and ugly, it doesn't give us a desire to follow him. The joy of the Lord is my strength, Nehemiah 8.10. In Nehemiah's day, when the words of the law were written were read, the people wept. He told the people, don't be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And as we thank God and take joy for what he has done for us, we find the strength to go on. And when God is revealing some brokenness or sin in our lives, it's because he has every intention of helping us. God loves us enough not to leave us in our sin. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. When we don't know how things will turn out, it may feel impossible to rejoice. That is why Paul says to, uh, to do it in the Lord, not in your circumstances. Your circumstances will not grant you the strength to, and joy to go on. Actually, your circumstances may be the very thing that is stealing your strength and joy. But praise be to God, he is our source, not what has or what will happen to us. God is an everlasting source of joy and strength. And the more we depend on him, the more strength and joy we experience. God is joy, and he is not the mean, ugly, and angry, distant God. But, but we need to believe that he is there for us in our time of need, and we will be strengthened by that. And I just want to share a little bit of my testimony here at the end, um, last year was just a very, very challenging year for my husband and I. Um, January, I had knee surgery. And in my, in my mind, I was too young to have knee surgery. I, to be really honest, I got really angry that I had to have knee surgery. And then one day I was reading scripture and it said, sing unto the Lord a new song. And I'm like, Lord, I do not have a new song to sing to you. And all of a sudden he said to me, how about a song of surrender? And I sang that song. I surrendered it to the hymn at that time. Um, the knee surgery went well, but I suffered a lot of nerve pain, a lot of sleepless nights, because the nerve pain would just shoot in my leg, and it just really hurt. In March, my husband had some testing done, and they told him that he had a cancerous tumor on his kidney and that we needed to get that checked out. So we continued on our journey in April, we went to a cappella sing, and singing has a way of getting me right here. I love a good song. Um, my son-in-law, Justin, which our daughter Emily is here, it's her husband, sings with Crosswalk, and they sang, Help is on the Way. That became my, I hung on to that. That was my um, strength at that point, because I knew no matter if it's cancer, whatever happens, Help was on the way, and I needed that. So May 16th, my husband goes to, we went up to Fox Chase Center in Philadelphia to have this surgery. Um, Emily came and was my standby during that time also. Um, they, during surgery, um, they had told me, well, when, before we went for our visits, there was a sign there that we, I was not allowed to be with him unless I was vaccinated for COVID. Um, I had chosen not to be vaccinated. That was my choice. And, but every time we went up, they let me in because they realized it was my choice whether or not I wanted to be vaccinated. And so when we got up there that morning, they set us in a hallway. We were not allowed to go to surgical waiting. Well, we talked to them a little bit. They came soon and moved us into surgical waiting. Very long day. Um, during surgery, my husband had a bleed out from his kidney lost a lot of blood. He ended up on a ventilator and in ICU. Um, they removed his adrenal gland and he had a cyst that they took two liter of fluid out of. So that night I left that hospital to go home and for the first time in 40 years I could not talk to my husband. We weren't always together but I could always talk to him. And he was on a ventilator and they, the doctor even after he told us he said, um, he went down to the ICU and he said, can this woman please come see her husband? And they're like, no, she cannot. So I went home that night realizing that he was a very, very sick man and not knowing what was going to happen. And when, they re when the doctor spoke to us after the surgery, he said, I saved the kidney and I removed what appeared to be the cancerous tumor. I got all of the tumor. So he was in the hospital for five days up at, um, no, eight days. 
up at um, Fox Chase. So it was a two-hour trip every morning going up and a two-hour trip going home. And during that time, we were able to spread the joy. But um, that his surgery was Monday. Tuesday morning, Emily and I got up. We got dressed, believing. And oh, while I was waiting, I emailed the hospital administration. I said, can I please come see my husband without being vaccinated? I said, it's cruel and very wrong to be not be together at this point. And so we got dressed, we went out on the deck, and we were reading and praying and having coffee. The phone rang, and they said, I, they emailed my request to somebody that could do something about it. An hour later, we got a phone call. You can come see your husband whenever you want. <laughs> we have taken care of that. And I said, am I going to have to fight this every day? They said, no. We, they were no longer asking for the vaccination card to visitors that came in. So God answered in a mighty way. And while we were up there, I felt like we were able to witness to people, to spread joy to those that came into our room. My husband was very much an encourager to the ones that took care of him. So we were home for five, oh, while we were up there, they, the biopsy came back, no cancer, none whatsoever, none. So that gave us great reason to rejoice. He was home for five days, and Saturday morning he woke up, and he was not feeling well at all. And he said, I said, you need to eat. He said, no, just let me sleep. And I said, no, something is wrong. And I, my one daughter encouraged me to take his blood pressure, and it was very, very low. So I got a neighbor man, paramedics, to come over and take it. It was very, very low. He said, this man needs to go to the hospital. And he got him to stand where he could no longer stand or see at that point. So we called the ambulance out. He was in septa shock. The doctor told me later on, if I had left him go back to sleep, it would have probably been the end. So then he was in the hospital for 13 days. And I know the one day he was compliment, my husband was complimenting his nurse, and the nurse said, that is the kindest thing I have been told in the last couple months, because they needed to be appreciated. Can we spread the joy in hard times? Yes, we can. We can have joy. And you know, praise became my weapon during that time. That's all I had to give was praise for the good that he did do, even when I didn't feel it. And that one night, his heart went into AFib, and they had called me and told me that. And I said, Lord, I cannot handle one more thing. He said, I'm not asking you to. He said, I'll do it. I'll take care of it. And he did. But because of our foundation in Jesus Christ, if we go into hard times and we're not founded and rooted in God's word and what he says, who we are, who he is, we're... The joy doesn't happen as quickly. So the year went on, and we had a very good, interesting summer. Um, six weeks after he was out of septic shock, he went back in with a bowel blockage, which is very normal after kidney surgery. And so once again, we were faced with that, and we missed our family vacation. We had all planned to go to Colorado for a family vacation, all the children and grandchildren. And so instead, they all came home one at a time, which was very, very special times. And then in October, I had my knee surgery, my other knee surgery. <laughs> so life just continues to go on, and that knee surgery was 100% better than my other one was. I'd like to leave you with this. Imagine with me a garden. The paths in the garden are narrow and uneven. The park bench is dirty with missing slats. There are some beautiful flowers, but they're hidden under the weeds. The water in the fountains are green and dirty, and there's only a small little bubble in the middle. And as you sit on the bench, you can barely relax for fear of the bench collapsing. You hear a voice beckoning you to come. And as you glance over your shoulder where the voice is coming from, you see a beautiful garden. The paths are wide, beautifully done with stamped concrete, there is a beautiful glider swing surrounded by bright colored flowers and look, lush looking shrubs. The water in the fountain is clear, shooting to the sky. The sun is shining brightly, causing the water to sparkle. And as you sit amongst the overgrown shrubs and weeds, contemplating, should I go over and enjoy that beautiful place? Would my ugly bag with romance novels and questionable movies be out of place? What about the ugliness of my unforgiveness, self-pity, and grudges? 
Can I really let go of my past hurts? Would the bright sunlight reveal what is in my, really in my heart? Can I let go of my disappointments and enjoy the beauty? The voice continues to beckon. And, but, I stubbornly hang on, but I stubbornly want to just hang on in all that I believe in, that I'm not good enough. I really do need all this to make me happy. What will happen if I totally surrender my hopes dreams, and passions. Can I truly trust? Then I get a clear picture of the one beckoning me to come. His arms are outstretched telling me, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Will you come? Will you choose joy for your life and your marriage? It is ours to choose but it's in surrendering to what God has for us and allowing that joy to come a part of our lives. And I heard a song the other day, and the third verse just really, really blessed me. And I want to read, and then I have handouts for you. I want to, this, maybe you can stand it by your kitchen window. Um, it's the song, Like a River Glorious, and this is the third voice, the third verse. Every joy or joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon a dial, by the Son of Love. We may trust Him fully, all for us to do. They who trust Him wholly find Him wholly true. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as He promised perfect peace and rest. And I might add to that joy. So let's go with our heart's purpose to stay upon Jehovah and His Word. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>